Hi, in trying to solve the problem of how to replace this obsolete spherical bush bearing, first of all we need to look exactly what it does and why it's that kind of bush. It's an odd thing, although it is found on all kinds of motorcycle suspension linkage, I now know. The thing is, um, obviously your swing arm moves up and down and up and down as you hit the bumps. It's pivoted tightly in the frame and this bearing has a job of moving up and down with the shock absorber. Now, that's fine under normal use. However, thinking about it, under stressed conditions, hard cornering, twisting round, the forces on the frame, actually frames tend to twist and turn and swing on, move around a little bit. I know from racing classic motorcycles, 1960 Suzuki frames, frame bending is a genuine problem. And what happens with this bearing is as the shock is moving up and down and up and down and up and down. If there's any twist, as you can see here, this spherical bush can cope with any twisting by moving up and down and up and down quite happily side to side while still moving away. So that's why they use these. So under extreme conditions, frame flexing, swing arm moving around, this means uh, the suspension will move up and down and up and down with no extra friction created by sideways forces trying to move a bearing sideways. So my question is, as this seems to be unobtainable, do we actually need a spherical bush bearing? If I could get one, that would be fine. If I can't, can I replace it with a needle roller? I think I probably can. So what I'm going to do is go for a needle roller conversion. This is something I read about on a forum where somebody else had had the problem and I am following their guy, their instructions. So this is not my original idea. I was going to go this way, uh, but it was so nice to have that help. I'll give a little link to the um, website underneath the, the forum where this was suggested uh, and so you can give them proper credit. Now the idea with a needle roller, of course, is here's the linkage, as we know, that's on the suspension at your way up actually. And so this is moving up and down, up and down, and uh, as I've talked about. Now the thing is, there is a little bit of play, not that you can feel it here in that bearing, a little bit of play here, a little bit of play in the swing arm. Um, none of these uh, bearings on here, these needle rods are really tight. So if there is a little bit of frame flex, a little bit of swing arm flex, it'll cope quite admirably without any problems, I believe. And if it's a under extreme conditions, and let's be fair, I'm not racing this thing, I'm not like a works rider, I'm just having a lot of fun. If under extreme conditions, there's a frame's twisting and you hit a big bump, there may be a little bit more stiction, a little bit more resistance to movement than normal for a fraction of a second. I can't see that being a big problem. So that's what I'm going to do, and I'll now show you what parts I'm going to use, how I'm going to do this, and hopefully you can do the same thing on yours. So this is the bearing I'm going to be using. Nice needle roller, NK1720 is its uh, designated number. I'll give you a list at the end. Now this is 25 millimeters outside diameter, just like the other one. This one, too, 25 millimeters. However, that's where a slight problem arises. But if you measure the two together, you'll find the original one is 0.1 of a millimetre bigger. It's about 24.08, and this is about 24.98. Uh, so there's 0.1 difference. Now, of course, this was an interference fit, which you saw me press out in the uh, part one video. Uh, it wasn't hard to press out. It's not a tight interference fit, but it's an interference fit. Whereas this one, if you get it up to the housing and you match it up, it it's a bit fiddly, there we are, it's lined up, there we are, that fits in, now I can push that through, as you can see, quite easily with my hand. Now if there's no play, it's not loose, there's no play, but it's not an interference fit. So that, the first problem is to overcome that, and what we're going to use is some Loctite 638, good stuff. Um, this is a very strong bearing retaining compound. It holds bearings in, particularly if you've got slightly loose, um, you know, slightly worn uh, hat casing. It's very, very good at holding them firmly in place. So we're going to put this on, get that in position, and then that will, um, you have to let it dry off and get, you know, harden off. And we'll leave that to that, so that won't move then. There's, there's very, very little, little room, um, so that will work. Next, you have to get the inner. 
Now the inner comes separately from the part I've just bought. This has got a number IR1220-2 and that of course is going to fit inside the bearing like this. Now hopefully that would you'd think would be a direct fit but there's a problem again, a small problem, is that if you measure across this one here you'll find that that is about 22 millimeters. I'm upside down aren't I? Yeah, 22 that says 21.98, I'm not sure that's back to front, 21.98. And this one is basically 20.5. Now 20.5, one and a half less. How are we going to get around that? Well, what we get is some little shims. So I bought these little shims, they're on eBay. You get them dirt cheap, a couple of quid. Again, I'll give you the, the link below, tell you what they are. I've got a variety of sizes because um, the difference between 20.5 and 22 is 1.5 so I've got a couple of one millimeter shims that come in pairs a couple of half mil so if I put a one and a half one either side that should make up the difference now I have measured the difference between this old bearing and the new one with the two bushes in place and there is a minute difference of um, I think in imperial sorry four foul this is four foul smaller than the other one. Now, if you want to be an absolute perfectionist, you could put two one millimeter shims rather than a one and a half millimeter, and then turn down, turn down the little top hats, which you remember from video one, fit inside there. So you could make it slightly bigger by putting a one mil shim either side, and then taking about 0.2 off that surface on each one if you've got a lathe and you're fancy machining it up. Uh, I don't think I'll bother. I think for four hour I'm not going to really bother. That's very, very, very little. I can't remember what that is in metric. Um, okay, so that solves that problem. The guy on the forum who suggested this method, he also suggested buying two of these PTFE rings. Got them on eBay, made a size, a couple of quid. And on his, he had one on that side there, one on that side there, sort of to help with the uh, retention of the grease when you grease it up keep moisture and stuff out uh, and also what he did was on these bearings the, sorry these seals the two new seals you put on when you fit these on that way as you should he fitted them the opposite way round now if you fit them the opposite way round those PTFE little seals will fit in quite nicely if you fit them the way around KTM fitted them which way I'm going to do it the PTFE seal doesn't fit in and there's no need to do it. Now, I'm going to put these the correct way, the way that KTM did. And the reason is that the seal um, has the job of not just keeping them out of the muck, but if you squirt grease into, the, into here, into that gap, remember you've got a little grease nipple, if you're squirting grease into there through the bearing, it's going to come out and it's going to push against the seal and can escape that way. So every time you get your grease gun and pump away, you can squish out the grease and it'll come out of that bearing uh, to the outside. Whereas if you have them the wrong way, you'll just be building up some real pressure um, behind there because it'll be pushing tighter against the actual uh, sort of top hat that these run on. So that's not a way I'm going to do it. Now these seals, they're available from KTM still, not a the problem, they're a stock item, just for bearing you can't get. And also, if you damage yours, the top hats either side, the small top hats either side, if you've damaged yours, they're still available. It, sometimes they do get damaged. You'll have seen in video one that I had a drift banging down on the edge, really had to ha hammer it hard. And the second one particularly was very hard. I had to give it some real brute force, really. And it did batter up the edge. The little edge around here on the far edge was a little bit battered. So I've got a lathe, I put these in the lathe, took about a millimetre off each one, just cleaned them all up. And of course, they don't have to be a tight fit, they don't fit like this in the actual bearing, they fit like this with a gap in between anyway. So making that gap bigger has no effect whatsoever, because of course, um, this is the part doing the work, that's just, they're just locating the, these diameters there, just locating and to hold in position so there's no play. So you can buy these if yours got damage, you can get the seals, you can get everything you need apart from the bearing. So I've put a bit of the uh, Loctite 638 
in the um, housing. I'm going to put a little bit on the bearing. I don't want to fill that little trough up in the middle that the grease is going to go around. So I'll put a little blob on there. Just a little blob. And rub that in in a moment. Do be careful of this stuff. It's quite nasty. Right, I'm going to rub that in. And then I'll assemble that part up now. So there it is in position. You'll see it stands proud a little bit on this side. Well, it, it stands a little proud on both sides because the bearing's a little bit wider than the original one, the, you know, the housing is. Not a problem, it all fits in nicely. It just sticks out a little bit either side, very little. So that's now in position, the sealant's on. I'm now gonna wait for that to uh, go off, make that nice and um, firm before moving on to the next bit. I've left that now overnight um, and this is now absolutely solid. I can't move the bearing, that sealant's really done its job, it's spot on. Uh, I've taken the grease nipple out, which I really should have done uh, when I fitted the bearing in a way. It helps you look down a little hole and that way you can uh, make sure it's lined up. But mine is lined up perfectly, the groove lines up with the uh, grease nipple to what you want. So that's now solid, I'm really pleased at that. Uh, so now I'm going to put the seals either side get the seals in uh, and get the middle bit shimmed up and reassemble it all and try and get it on the bike today. So here's one of the top hats inside the inner. Uh, it's just resting in loosely, in fact it's not fully lined up perfectly. I've got the uh, one millimeter shim on this side. So what I'm now going to do um, is put that in a vise and, and uh, slowly press it into position. Um, I did have to rub down the inner Sorry, the outer of that top hat to make it fit. Um, it's still nice and tight. Uh, if you find it too tight, you could always uh, put the top hat in the freezer and put the uh, the bearing in a, in the oven. Oh, it'll just push straight on. Anyway, I think that's about ready. Let's see. So here it is in the vise, and as I slowly tighten that vise up, it's not too hard a pressure. Whoops! Just slowly tighten it up. Bit more, a little bit more, and let's make that firm. That's it, that's all the way down. So that side is now nice and tight, so I'll just take that out. And uh, there we are, there's that side already with the shim on. Now that side's nicely fitted, as you saw in the vice, that's very, very firm. This side I made slightly looser. Not very loose, I mean you still have to put it, it's loose there and then it starts getting tight about there and you have to really push it in. Now the reason of, let's get it all the way in, that still needs a little tap to finish it off, there's still a space there. So I've got a millimeter, uh, one mil shim that side, half mil shim that side. I'm going to tap those together uh, like that without putting it in the bearing because I want to see how it fits inside the shock. The shock of course has got fork at the bottom and I don't want the shock to be pulled inwards, bending those forks, which would be a stress point, or bent outwards when I put this in. So I'm going to push this together in my vise. I can't get any closer. Hopefully I can get it out again. And then test it inside the um, actual gap in the shock and make sure it's a nice firm fit. Now it'd be useful if you've got lots of different shims here. I just bought 1s and 0.5s. If you bought some 0.25s, 0.3s, 0.4s, you could get this thing absolutely spot on. I haven't done, so I hope this is going to be spot on. Let's see. Here's the fork at the bottom of the shock absorber, and this is where our bearing is going to fit. Now, because it isn't all assembled in the linkage, I can test my piece here to see it is a good, firm fit. And as you can see, that just slides up nicely. Is there any play? Mm, <laughs> three or four thou tops which is about what I said it was, it was a about three or four farrows. oops, that's about 0 0.1 of a millimeter. And um, that means that basically when you tighten it up, there'll be a little bit of flex pulling these two in by hardly anything, just a little bit, and that'll hold it nice and firm. So if you spent long enough with a whole load of shims, taking it back and forwards, this apart, putting in 0.25s, 0.2s, 0.1s, you can make it absolutely perfect, but one and a half seems to do the job. I'm happy with that. So what I need to do now is to get the seals in position in the housing. Sometimes it's a good idea to give the housings a little bit of heat, if you can. 
No, not ridiculous amount, just to make it a little bit bigger to get the seals in easier. With this one, as it's already got rubber seals in place and it's got it's greased up needle rollers, you know, I'm not going to bother with that. But I have, I must admit, put the, um, the new uh, seals in the freezer because why not have them a little bit colder? They've got a metal outer side and um, might as well just shrink them a little bit. So we've got to press them obviously in this location, uh, locating uh, ring either side, they'll fit in there nicely. Um, and to do that, I'm going to put the, in my vise, put, put one in position and slowly squeeze it in in the vise, get it nicely in position. Fortunately, these seals, as we're sort of fitting them the wrong way around, like we discussed earlier with the sealing surface on the inside, um, you're not going to do any damage because um, occasionally people do putting seals in. Nice, easy job. So I'll go and get on with that now. So I've got the uh, seals out of the freezer and I'll now put that into position. I've put a bit of grease in the housing just to hold it nicely. Um, yeah, I'll put it that side, I think. So a little bit of fiddling, get everything lined up correctly. How's that looking? That's about right. I think a bit of wood's a bit angled. Will it go in? Come on. No, I'll abandon that. Well, that didn't quite work. So I've rejigged it, as you can see, with a G-clamp, a nice flat piece of metal on this side, and that way I can slowly push it in and control it a bit better than I could in the vise. What I did find useful is I can actually just tap any side that's standing a bit proud so it's going in square, and that seems to be going in nicely now. That was a lot better. Let's move that back up, centralise that. Well, it was a good plan in the vice, but that is far better using a G clamp. Uh, so it is a bit fiddly. That seems to be home now. Let's have a little look. Plunk. Yeah, that's almost flush. Give it a little tap, I think, with a little hammer just to locate it the last little bit. You can hear it, it sounds flush. Job done. Right, now let's try and do the other one. It was hard to do that way, so as my uh, G clamp has got quite a big end on it, I've just put the G clamp on itself flat, and that's actually been easier than the other method. So I should just be able to finish that off now. Right, let's go. So let's just. In she goes. You just have to keep your eye on it, make sure it's going in lined up. You don't want it in skew whiffed. That's a tiny bit high at the top. Let's move your G cramp. Nearly there. Oh, that's looking better. Yeah, that just needs tapping down just to finish it off, which I'll probably do with my hammer like I did last time. Just give it a gentle tap, don't whack it too hard. So now I'm ready to put the thing back together. Let's put the grease nipple back in if you haven't already. That's a 7mm spanner you need on that one, or socket, whichever you've got. Just give that a little tighten up. Now examining this and looking at it, one of the seals is very, very slightly further out on that side. It's not flush, as that one is flush. Now looking at it and measuring it up, the reason is the housing of the actual bearing inside, which we put inside, the actual housing is slightly wider. And it means it's holding these bushes slightly proud. I don't think that's, well, it's not a problem, because you'll see when the top hats are on, there's loads of room. So let's assemble it now, put some grease on, put the top hats on, check everything's okay. 
So that's nicely greased up, plenty of grease on there. Now let's get first top out into position. That's it, you can hear it pop into the seal. Second one, don't forget the shim uh, on the slightly looser one. And there we have it. A nicely assembled, moving, lovely new bush bearing. Well, needle roller bearing in this case. So here's my assembled P3 to go on. I'm just going to check the greasing system works. I know it does. So if I get my grease gun on there, what a handful this is, and squeeze away, we should. Lovely. You can see the grease coming out past the seals as designed on both sides, which means I can re-grease it at any time and know the whole system's working. Really pleased with that. So, okay, I've lost a little bit of the sideways movement if the swing arm flexes. So we're going to go back on the bike now and then I'll go out and test it and see how it is. Excellent work. Okay, so now let's try and get uh, this all lined up correctly and put back in. I did say in the video it went that way up and I was wrong. It does go that way up. Um, so I'm going to put this big one at the top in first. Just off the top of that camera there, I think. That's going to be that. Once that's lined up it should be a lot easier. Just tap that into position. A little screwdriver just to make sure just to bobble it into exactly the right place. It's quite a firm fit. That there. I think so. Let's have a little see if we get the bolt in. Soon find out. Right, I'll just wobble that a little bit more. Get that in position. That looks better. That sounds like it's going in. That's that one through. So now I can put. The next one's through, the next big one's this side. Now I'll put that one in first. I think I'm going to have to jack the back end up, of course, because when I took this out, the back end moved a little bit to get the position right. That looks pretty close. Well, that took some real fiddling with. Um, one of the reasons is uh, the bike, obviously, with this bolt out in the bike position, um, the bike can be the back end can be moved up and down. You need to move the back the wheel up a little bit just to get it in a better position. It's through now. Just tap it through like that. Just needs tightening up. And again, with these ones. Oh yeah, can't do those, so that's tightened up. So let me just tighten that up, and then I'll come back and do the central one. Uh, lining up this last one is, looks a bit tricky, but of course everything's moved. The wheels move, the bike's moved, everything's moved around. So if I move my trolley jack, if I jack the trolley jack up, you'll probably see, as I move it, that comes closer and closer into position. So you can fiddle around for ages, but actually, if you did put it up on a trolley jack and it's moved, which mine certainly has, I nearly there, a tiny bit more, I think. If you put it on a trolley jack and the trolley jack slowly um, let itself down a bit, everything's out of position. And look at that, straight through. So there we are, we've got all the bolts in, in uh, position. Put the nut on that one. What I've got to do now is uh, tighten it all up, get everything um, talked up, check it, bounce it up and down a few times, make sure it's okay. Go out for a test ride. So there we are, folks. Job done. And I think it's going to work out okay. It moves up and down the suspension nicely because of the seat already. It's nice, easy motion like it should be. I can't see it being a problem like I explained earlier, but you've lost a little bit of that lateral, that sort of side to side motion as everything flexes. Long term, we'll see. There may be increased wear on a few of the other components, um, but I had no choice. It was off the road, 
I haven't got a bearing, now it's working and in 5,000, 10,000 miles, who knows, maybe it will be a little bit more wear, but we'll see. So I hope you found this video useful. If you did find it useful, please click like and uh, why not subscribe to my channel for more things to do with KTMs and lots of other motorbikes. Uh, let me know how you get on if you do this um, modification. Uh, I'd be interested to hear. Just leave a comment down below. So catch you later. Please like and subscribe. Bye.